putting this on airplane mode, you know. We're back! No, we're not. Oh! That's a knee slapper! All right, well again, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church and to Fake News Part 2. What is fake news? Well, we are inundated with all kinds of information and, and uh, what we're finding is that in our day and time, in our culture and society, in particular, we have an issue where, you know, people like to kind of create their own stories, right? And propagate these stories as fact and as truth, when in fact and in truth, they're not true at all, right? They're not connecting with reality. And the question is, is Christianity fake news? Is Christianity merely a uh, a fairy tale? Is it a myth? Is it wishful thinking by those who need a crutch to get through life and face the uncertainty that goes beyond this world? Or is there a certainty to this particular faith? What, it is, what is it about this Jesus Christ of Nazareth that has garnered such attention that his life here on earth has influenced history itself. We mark and measure our history by his presence here on earth with B.C. and A.D. And I know there's a movement to change that, but name another religious figure whose birthday is celebrated by the entire world, even the non-Christian community out there. Oh, they are just as much involved in the holiday spirit as everybody else, aren't they? Name another historical, religious, political, or celebrity figure who has seen such praise and opposition and persecution, whose name has literally become the only one that has been the object of derision and vulgarity. His name has gotten turned into a cuss word. I don't see that happening with Muhammad or Allah or Buddha or anybody else. Just Jesus. Why? What is it about this guy that stirs up such passion, positive and negative? And is there any reason for this? We're seeing that there is. So, last week... We laid a foundation of the rules of the game. We are in a process of figuring out what is fake news. And there's a lot out there. There's a lot of things that are propagated as being fact or truth, when in both fact and truth, they are neither. And then there is truth and fact. And we're trying to sift through all that's out there and figure out a process of discernment. So last week we laid the ground rules because our job in our time together is to figure out specifically is this news, the news that God entered our world and became one of us, incarnate, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Was he really everything that he claimed to be and everything that the people around him claimed him to be? Was he really God in the flesh? Was he really Savior and Lord of all humanity and creation? Or was he merely, as some would propose, if he even existed, was he merely a good man, a good teacher, and perhaps even a good prophet or spiritual leader of God? We're figuring out through the witnesses and the testimonies and the evidence that exists whether this faith in Jesus Christ being Lord of all has any real rationale. Is there any certainty to this that we can have confidence, which by the way, the word faith 
means confidence, trust. So these are the ground rules. In order for us to play the game right and together and unified, our ground rules are number one, to recognize that while facts are true, they are not the whole truth. So facts cannot be isolated to say what we want them to say. We have to piece the facts together to see the picture that they make, right? Agreed? So that was the first one. And then as we piece the facts together and see what picture they make, now we start to see a much larger picture of truth. So again, facts are true, but they're not the whole truth. The second rule in our little game, the second rule is that we understand that we will never know it all. We will never have all the facts. We will never have the full picture of truth in all of its greatness, that our understanding is limited. We are finite creatures. Therefore, we will have to make a decision based on the in answers we do have, not the answers we don't. So that is called faith. So we will exercise faith. Once we piece these facts together, we will get a picture, and then we have a decision to make, and that is, will I put my trust in this Jesus, this story, or will I relegate it as nothing more than one of the many myths and wishful thinkings and fairy tales that are out there? And then lastly, friends, the last rule of the game is that we have to go to the source. If you and I want to understand mathematics, then are we going to go to an English manual? Are we going to a Spanish manual to learn about mathematics? No. No, we would go to a mathematics manual. We would go to that textbook. Well, friends, when it comes to understanding the life and the teachings and the, the claims of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we need to go to the source. We need to go to the compilation, the records that have been compiled of the witnesses and their testimonies and the events that occurred by those who saw them and experienced them. And there is only one authorized and authenticated resource that has faced more scrutiny, more study, more persecution and hostility than any other resource in the history of the world, and that is the Bible. And yet, under all of its scrutiny and all of its testing and all of its, its poking and prodding, the scripture continues to stand the test of time as an authentic and the authorized resource to understand God Almighty, creator of the universe, savior of the world, who entered our world as Jesus Christ. So, it is that book that we will use, and we will use other historical references, okay? Jo Flavius Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, to name one, and some others. But we will look at those, but we're going to look at the documented, recorded testimonies of the folks that were there, that saw this happen, okay? So today, what we're going to be diving into starts in Luke chapter 1, and we're picking up where we left off last week, which is Dr. Luke, who is a Phoenician, an Assyrian physician, so he had no connection to Judaism or the Jewish people. This is very important. There was nothing about his life that would cause him to show favor or openness to this Jew, Jewish carpenter who claimed to be God in the flesh and savior of the world. Okay? In fact, being an Assyrian, he was one of two things. He was either a polytheist, meaning that he believed in many gods. And so if this Jesus was in fact a God, he would just be one of many. 
and being a polytheist of a Greco-Roman background, a Medo-Persian background, he would also be one who believed in the, what you and I refer to as Greek and Roman mythology, and, and they had no problem with gods manifesting because they saw gods, and we know them to be demons from our fall series in October, um, they believed that these gods did manifest at various times in different forms, sometimes as people, sometimes as animals, sometimes as half people animals, right? And so they would have been open to this, but they would not have subscribed to him being the one and only and the almighty, okay? Secondly, because Luke, this Assyrian physician, was in fact a very highly educated individual, I don't know if you've noticed, but much of the academic world tends to pride itself on its abilities of reason and intellect, and they typically reason themselves right out of any kind of belief in something bigger than they can understand. So they have a very difficult time embracing through logic and reason a God that they can't touch, feel, or explain, okay? And so the challenge that I would pose to those folks is explain logic. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever felt it? Have you ever touched it? And, and where, where did it begin? And where does it end? And all of this stuff, you know, and we, we, we have to accept that there are things that are outside of us, right? And bigger than us. So, but being this physician, Luke was a very highly educated man. And so very possibly moved away from the, what we refer to as mythology of his day and moved more toward intellectualism, being very thorough in his, and rigorous in his training and in how he handled dealing with situations and facts. So this is Dr. Luke. Now, Dr. Luke crossed paths with the Apostle Paul and we don't know whether it was under Paul's ministry directly or somebody else, but somehow this Jesus guy got Dr. Luke's attention and he became a fully devoted follower of Jesus and propagator of the faith. Dr. Luke joined the Apostle Paul and became really one of Paul's right-hand men in establishing churches throughout Asia Minor. So this Dr. Luke, in the course of his coming to faith and, and helping establish the church, Dr. Luke set out to thoroughly research the events of the life of Jesus Christ. And so in Luke chapter 1, this is what he said. And by the way, there was a man named Theophilus who was a, uh, a nobleman and he was a believer in Jesus, but he actually uh, asked Luke um, to do some research, and, and apparently Luke had a relationship with him that he was able to speak into Theopolis's life. And so, really, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, both written by Dr. Luke, um, are actually addressed to this noble Men, Christian named Theopolis. So in Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 1, it says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So we're not dealing with just secondhand information or thirdhand information. Verse 3. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything. Underline that phrase. Carefully investigated everything. So this is a physician applying his discipline to the research behind the faith. I, I too, decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. So that you may know the certainty, circle that phrase, the certainty of the things you have been taught. And friends, 
I want to just subscribe and propose to you and reinforce to you and any other kind of word you can come up with to solidify in your heart and your mind that there is a certainty to the Christian faith. So, Luke chapter 1 in your outlines continues to tell the story of two separate angelic encounters prophetic declarations, and miraculous conceptions. So I'm going to summarize for you Luke chapter 1 today. I'm going to challenge you to go read it on your own so that you may know what God's word says, what the testimonies actually say word for word. However, I do want you to understand that Dr. Luke started the research and the story talking to the witnesses, not with Jesus doing his miracles, but rather before Jesus was even conceived. He goes back before that in his research. So here's the summarization. First of all, we said that there are two separate angelic encounters as well as prophetic declarations and miraculous conceptions. So start with the first. Number one is the parents of John the Baptist. In the Christmas story, as we talk about Mary conceiving Jesus in her womb, we actually need to go back a little bit before that. We need to go back to some other people, and that is Zechariah and Elizabeth. So Zechariah was a priest. Zechariah the priest is visited by an angel, and in your outlines he is told that he will have a son in his old age and that the child will be the forerunner of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. This is very important. Zechariah is doing his temple duties. He goes into the holy place and he is visited by this angel who gives him a prophetic message about not only will he and his wife have a child in their elderly years, which will be miraculous, but he also gives this prophetic message that he's the forerunner of who they've been waiting for, this Messiah, the Savior of the world, God in the flesh. Everything that God said in the Old Testament that he was coming and he was going to do it. Well, guess what? The time has come. Now, Zechariah hears the message, but like many of us, he's an old man. Do you all agree with that? You agree that you're old. Anybody else? I'm just seeing if you're awake. Don't be a baby bird that just swallows anything that's said. Okay? No, 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 no. So pay attention. Are you old here today? Okay, some of you are, some of you are. Okay, so Zechariah is old. Zechariah is old, and, and so he has a hard time believing. Is this really going to happen? And as a result, the angel says, you know what? You don't believe what God has said? through this angelic celestial messenger, fine, you can be mute. So, next point, Zechariah is made silent by the angel. And, and of course, there's some debate whether he was both mute and deaf or just mute, but bottom line is he was made silent by the angel until time to name the baby. Not just that the baby was conceived, not just that the baby was born, but until it was time to actually name the baby, at which point a crowd witnessed his healing and his prophetic message of John's role as the forerunner of the Messiah. So a crowd observed. They saw Zechariah come out of the temple, mute, silent, they saw the miraculous conception of these two old people now having a baby. They saw the father of that child remain silent until it was time to name the kid, at which point the crowd thought for sure, we're naming him after daddy. And Elizabeth, the mother, knew what the story was, and she said, no, we're naming him John. And the crowd argued because it was the man's responsibility to name the child. And so they looked to Zechariah and he gave the answer 
wrote it down. His name is John. And at that point, in front of the crowd, the man starts to speak again. Whatever it was that was causing him to be mute and possibly deaf is now gone. And in front of everybody, he starts to talk, and the man then begins to prophesy about his son and a Messiah to come. Now, one other thing is that Elizabeth, who is Zach's wife, stays secluded up to her sixth month of pregnancy. This is just noteworthy, okay? Now, the second angelic visitation, we all know, are the parents of Jesus. Now, in your outlines, Mary is a betrothed virgin is chosen to be the bearer of the incarnate God, God becoming a real human being. Also, Mary is told about her cousin's not yet public pregnancy. That's why it's noteworthy that Elizabeth stayed in seclusion for the first six months. Because three months into, three to six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary, who lived in another town and knew nothing about the pregnancy, was now prophetically told by an angel. These are details that corroborate stories that her cousin was, in fact, pregnant even as an old lady. So this is a divine revelation. Now, when Mary is told that she's now pregnant with the God incarnate, she does not immediately run off and tell Joseph. Instead, she runs away. She comes up with a story, and she goes off to Elizabeth's house. She figures if anyone is going to understand her plight, it will be Elizabeth, who also has had this encounter with God. So she goes to Elizabeth's, and Elizabeth, note this in your outlines, Elizabeth prophetically recognizes Mary as being pregnant with the Lord before Mary speaks a word. So Mary just walks in through the door, and according to Elizabeth, she feels her, her, ba her own child in her womb jump for joy, kick, nah. right? And, uh, and she says, whoa, what, what has happened that I am blessed with this privilege to have the mother of my Lord come visit me? The mother of the Lord. Now, there's another angelic encounter that takes place in this story. However, it's not in documented in the book of Luke. It is documented. This testimony is recorded in the book of Matthew. The apostle Matthew wrote it down. So Matthew chapter one, I want you to see the testimony. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. I want you to underline that found to be pregnant. She didn't go out and tell everybody and we'll talk about why in a moment. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her. I want you to underline that. Had in mind to divorce her. That was his plan. But he was going to do it quietly. But after he had considered that, notice he did consider divorcing her. This was a big deal to him. His fiance, which their engagement was as solid as marriage in their day, she, she's found to be pregnant and it's not his kid. So notice the distress and the emotion in the story. How did Joseph feel about this news? Not good. So after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So notice it is an angel, an angelic encounter. However, this one is in a dream. 
and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you, circle you, because Joseph has a part in the story. And it's actually a much bigger part than you might think. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So make note, 400 four to 600 years before Jesus arrives on the scene, it was foretold that the virgin will be with child. And this is no ordinary child, as it's no ordinary conception. He will be called Emmanuel. What does that name, that title mean? Literally, God with us. Might want to underline that. When Joseph woke up, notice he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And note, he gave him the name Jesus. So both of the men in this story, while seemingly playing the smaller role, have a, a major part in this story. So based on Luke chapter 1 and now Matthew chapter 1, which I again want you to go read these on your own in their entirety. There are some things to make note of, and we're going to move through them quickly. Number one, notice that Zechariah's disability, definitely mute, possibly even deaf, was publicly verified. Okay? His disability was publicly verified from his angelic encounter to the temple, in the temple, to the day that he named John. So this disability was publicly verified, and the season of that disability was publicly verified. And note that he had a role in the story. Who was it that named John the Baptist? Zechariah did. Number two thing to note is that the pregnancy of John was miraculous as both parents were labeled, listed as very old and considered beyond childbearing years. And that's noteworthy because... It's a physician that's writing that testimony. He would have known whether these people could or could not have had children. Number three, Mary did not initially tell Joseph of her pregnancy and the angelic encounter, but instead went to her cousin's house for about three months. Why would Mary have done that? Do you think she's afraid? I think she's afraid. I think she totally believes God, but she also knows the world in which she lives and that unfaithfulness is penalized by death, stoning. And her becoming pregnant with a child that is not the child of her betrothed husband-to-be, it could go very, very bad for her. She's scared. However, her reaction, which let's be honest, wouldn't most of us, don't most of us, when we get scared, we try to hide things, right? So she initially goes away for three months. And Joseph doesn't know. So this, unfortunately, the way she's reacting, certainly gives Joseph good reason to be suspicious, right? Of foul play. And so we see what Joseph's response is, right? He certainly questioned the integrity of Mary. He certainly wondered who she'd been messing around with because he was going to divorce her. Let's move to number four. John's birth was celebrated by a crowd of people. So this didn't happen in isolation. 
this crowd of people, and they recognized and spread the news throughout the region regarding the miraculous birth and healing of Zechariah. So these events did not happen behind closed doors where only one or even two people, all it takes is two or three witnesses to establish something as true according to law. However, this is seen and experienced by an entire crowd of people. And they saw two things happen in front of their eyes. They saw a miraculous birth of this baby named John, and they saw the miraculous healing of his father who had been made mute. And while nobody else got to see the angel, they saw the effect of the angel in Zach's life. They saw that he was mute, silent, until the day that he named the kid, just like he said in the story. Number five. Once he was able to speak, Zechariah publicly prophesied regarding both his son and the Messiah to come. Who is he talking about? Number six. Mary's pregnancy, while unwed, became inconcealable, and she was found out. Notice that Mary, in the story, didn't come with a little halo and say, Hey, everybody, the Lord has met me, and I am with child through divine work, right? No. No, God said, Hey, you're blessed. And you have this great privilege of being a part of my story. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to move upon you and you will, in your womb, conceive and, and grow a baby. And it's not an ordinary baby. This baby is Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Fully God and fully man. And while she was privileged to be a part of the story, the Bible is very clear that she was afraid. She was afraid. When this angel first showed up and, you know, and, and called her blessed among women, she, she was not sure what this meant. And then once he said what was happening, she really got scared because she knew the potential consequences and the potential reaction of society. And what would her pledged husband say? How would he react to what, from a natural standpoint, would just be explained that she was unfaithful? Because the kid didn't come for me. Number seven, when Joseph found out about Mary's pregnancy, he found out. She didn't just tell him. The news didn't come out as, hey, everybody, let's go to church. God's done this incredible thing. We're going to talk about Mary today and how God's, you know, made her pregnant and, and is going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Let's celebrate it. No, no, no. She went away for three months and finally can't hide it anymore, and is found to be pregnant. And when Joseph finds out, he struggles like any of us would struggle if our special someone showed up pregnant. He actually considers breaking off the engagement, which, again, their engagement in that day was as binding as marriage, and so the word is literally divorce her. But he was a good man, and so he didn't want to cause a scene. He didn't want to humiliate her. He wasn't out to have justice, which would be stoning her to death. But do you understand how big of a role? It wasn't just that God picked the right woman. He had to have picked the right man. Or guess what? The story ends abruptly as he seeks justice and has her put to death for being unfaithful. No, it was the right man as well, a man who feared the Lord, a man who loved his bride-to-be. And he wrestled with it, friends. Sometimes the work of God is bigger than us. Sometimes it's hard to make sense of, and sometimes it's very, very uncomfortable. And yet, 
will we trust? So, number eight, due to an angelic encounter. Notice the facts here. Joseph took Mary to be his wife. This is inarguable. In spite of the fact that she was found to be pregnant, three months, disappears, shows up pregnant, says it's God. And he's supposed to believe that. But due to this angelic encounter, Joseph does obey. And some will argue, yeah, but it was in a dream. Hey, dream or showing up right here in front of you, either way, we find that God speaks to people in all kinds of ways, number one. And secondly, it was real enough that it got this man's attention, that he was able to push through the circumstances. God knows what you need and how you need it when you need it. So, due to an angelic encounter, Joseph took Mary to be his wife, but did not have intercourse with her until after Jesus' birth. Okay? He would not consummate the marriage. And this is important because we don't want any potential argument of other things slipping in there. Okay? We want to make sure that this is truly and completely just the work of God. No help from Daddy-O Joseph, right? So, while Joseph accepted Mary as his wife, they did not consummate the marriage, and, but afterwards, do note that they did and had many children, brothers and sisters that are half-brothers and sisters to Jesus. And we'll talk about them later on. Number nine, Joseph is the one who named Jesus. Again, this is the father's role and responsibility in that culture. Joseph named Jesus, demonstrating his faith and ownership in God's plan in spite of public opinion about his unfaithful wife and bastard son. That is the attitude of the culture. That's why we have that there. You need to understand that in our day and age, we see people having babies out of wedlock all the time. It's really quite normal. And whether we think favorably about it or not, not much is said. And it's just the way of the world. But in this day and time, it was a very big deal. And everybody knew, and everybody was watching, and seeing how this story was going to play out. And they watched how Joseph took ownership. And played a very significant and powerful role in this story. It wasn't one that was very common. And it wasn't one that was looked favorably upon in society. Number 10. Zechariah indirectly and then directly Elizabeth, Mary, and Joseph all identified the unborn Jesus as Lord, Messiah, and God in the flesh. And friends, this is the key point of the story. This is where it's all going to. The end result of this story is that God is going to enter our world as one of us. And how could he do that unless he was born of a woman? You see, God can't become a human being and do a perfect life as a human representative and then take the punishment of all mankind as a human representative if he's not, in fact, human. So, he had to be born of a woman. And it had to be the right woman and the right man at just the right time in earth's history. These are the facts. There's no denying these facts. They were testified to by the firsthand accounts of these witnesses. They were seen not by just one person here or there or even two. Much of this took place in the eyes of crowds and society at large. Everybody knew where Joseph the carpenter lived with his white, unfaithful wife and their illegitimate son. It was that kind of day. So here's the question as we wrap up today. The question that you and I 
need to answer based on just today. We're going to look at the whole nativity story. But the question for today, understanding that the probability of the humiliation, the rejection, the disgrace, the derision, becoming social outcasts and spiritual outcasts because this kind of behavior would get you kicked out of the temple, which was a center of society and, and life in their day. So this meant an entire change in their status in society and their way of life. And then, of course, the possibility of death for Mary as an adulteress. With all of this in mind, here's the question. Why would any of these people make this up and put themselves through the public, public humiliation as well as the personal pain in order to propagate a lie about their child and their second cousin? Think about that for a second. Why would they make this up? So that Joseph could be publicly humiliated by accepting Mary as his wife in spite of her unfaithfulness and raising this child as his own while everybody knew she was three months pregnant and she was at Elizabeth's house. Which meant Joseph had no touchy-touchy. Are you tracking with this? Oh, she was long past the time that we could blame Joseph for this. Why would, they, why would this young teen put herself at risk like that? Why would this man say this? Why would the other people say these things? And, and why would the crowd make up what they saw with Zechariah? And Elizabeth. So, friends, these are the facts. These are the testimonies of the eyewitnesses and those that experienced these things. And now we're piecing these facts into a picture. And so far, our picture is that God has done a miraculous work in the lives of these two couples. It was certainly out of the box of what is normal or publicly, socially accepted, but it was miraculous nonetheless, and it seems to be the fulfillment of the picture that he painted in the Old Testament of God entering our world to become the savior of all mankind. Hence the title, Emmanuel, God with us. So what do you think? about these testimonies? What do you think about the declaration, the claims? This isn't even Jesus' claims yet. This is what other people are saying about him and saying that angels have said about him. Before he was conceived, before he was born, what do we say about him? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your many blessings. And right now we just pray that you would continue to bless and guide and direct us throughout this Christmas season. As we continue to unpack the details of the story, may the reality of the story, may the, the, the reality and the realness of the eyewitnesses, those that personally experienced these things and then saw others experiencing these things, may it all just begin to paint this amazing and incredible picture, but one that is clear and accurate one that holds the weight of all of the challenges that life will bring into our lives as we try to make sense of God and, and who you are and what you want to do in our life. And Father, it's so much more than just intellectual arguments against the deity of Christ. It's, it's the other kinds of stuff like marital strife and, and sick children and financial problems and and addictions and hurts from people that we thought cared about us. And, and our faith needs to have that kind of strength as well. 
So no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, may we remember not only that 2,000 years ago, God entered humanity and became one of us and was God with us, but he continues to do so today. That this same Jesus continues to live on and that the spirit of God continues to live in us and God is with us and will see us through every situation, every storm, every trial. May you strengthen us in the certainty of our faith this day. And as we continue through this series, may that certainty just become stronger and stronger in our life that no matter what we face or go through, we may be able to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.